Welcome to today's session. My name is Ravneet Kaur and I manage on-farm programs here at SASC Work. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few housekeeping announcements from our end. We would like all attendees to mute themselves during the presentation and ask any questions you might have at the end. To ask questions, you can um, use the raise your hand feature, unmute yourself and ask your question or use the chat function on your screen. With that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Mara Rositas, founder of Signature Swine Solutions, Inc. Mara began her career in swine industry in 1995. She's proud to have mastered every task there is to do on a hog farm. Having managed farms for, from large integrators and small independent producers alike, she saw the need for a service that brings timely, qualified, hands-on help to hog operations. These days, Mara uses her skills and experience to support farms of any size and their people. She provides on-site services ranging from temporary labor to leadership training and production management. She's passionate about making work fun by finding innovative ways of looking at old problems and injecting humor when appropriate. Um, with that, Mara, take it away. Thanks, Ravneet. So excited to be here today. We are so excited for the presentation. All right, well, I guess I will jump right into it. I will start sharing my screen. Perfect. All right, here we go. Looks good, Mara. All right. So I'm going to start with a few animal care tips and tricks. And then after that, we'll move into handling. Now, this is going to be a pretty quick overview. And it's meant to be general things that would work just about anywhere. I really want to emphasize that every farm's different and remind everyone to please follow your vet's instructions for treatment of sick and injured animals. Now, when I visit farms, I often see pigs which are quite far down the path of illness before they're identified and treated. By the time these animals are treated, their chances of making a full recovery are actually quite low compared to if they are found sooner. Pigs are prey animals and they're gonna hide their disability from us if they possibly can. But there are a few tricks we can use to help find them earlier. For breeding stock, we want to make sure they get up every day. Now, I'm not suggesting you need to chase every animal up, but look for signs that they haven't been up. This sow, for instance, clearly has a bunch of feed left over. So we can be pretty sure there's something up with her and we should investigate what it is, right? Now, if you have electronic feeders, you can check their records. If, if you have a stall barn, you can easily see if they get up when you feed them in the morning. Now, it's a bit trickier in ad lib feeding situations, but most sow feeders have at least a partly transparent pipe, so you can see if they've eaten since the last time the system filled. Honestly, simply making sure animals get up once per day is one of the most surefire ways to know they're okay. Healthy pigs have a super strong feed drive. So if they aren't getting up to eat, we really wanna investigate why. Are they lame? Have they just farrowed? Maybe they were vaccinated recently. Then once you've identified the problem, the animal should be treated according to your vet's instructions. Now here, I really wanna point out that it takes exactly the same amount of time and effort to treat an animal early in their illness as it will later on. And your chances of success are so much greater if you can act early. Another way to quickly identify pigs that are just starting to feel a bit sick is to look for animals that are not doing what the rest of the group is doing. Maybe some of you remember this song. Not like the others, one of these things doesn't belong. 
song can you tell which thing is not like the other? I finish the song. Now I know every farm has time constraints and inspecting every animal individually isn't practical or even possible, right? One of the quickest ways to spot problems is to have a staff member do a quick scan of the pens. Now this scan is less about inspecting pigs individually and more about spotting the ones that are just a little bit off out of the corner of our eye. Here are some examples one or two pigs in a litter aren't nursing when the rest of the litter are. Or if we're looking at a pen in pigs of any size, we're looking for the one that doesn't quite fit in. It might be thinner or dirtier. It might be lying in a different area or it might be in a different position from its pen mates. Check out this litter. Are there any pigs here that make you think, hmm, I wonder if that one's okay? Now, in my opinion, it would be worth checking out this one. It's lying a little bit away from the group and it just looks different. Experienced technicians with a good eye can often accomplish this while they're feeding or scraping. The thing is though, that's not the natural thing for us to do. We typically are focused on the job that we're doing and we're not really noticing out things outside that narrow focus. Training and practice can often help inexperienced techs to learn to look outwards and pick up on animals that are just starting to go downhill. Now, this is training is an investment, okay? And it takes patience. But if you can identify and treat these pigs before they get to that next level, you can save money and misery. Nobody likes to put a bunch of effort into treating an animal only to have to euthanize it a few days later. It sounds like a lot of work, right? But the only real difference is taking that small amount of time to scan. The sick pigs you find early would have to be treated at some point anyway. So getting to them earlier just increases your chances of actually saving them. If you can delegate a stock person with a good eye to identify potential problem pigs, another staff member can go back and treat them later. It doesn't all have to be done at the same time, and it doesn't all have to be done by the same person. Now I'm going to take a little bit of time to talk about something nobody likes to think about. I know it's an unpleasant subject, but timely and humane euthanasia is a critical part of our duty to the animals in our care. How many times have you thought, geez, that one's not going to make it. And then you forgot about it or got too busy. And that pig laid there suffering all day or maybe even longer, leading to something that looks like this. Now I'm definitely not judging. I've done it too. I hope over the years I've become more sensitive to the needs of the pigs in my care and I'm a bit quicker to make the call when it needs to be made. Here's one thing I've learned. No matter when euthanasia is done, it takes the same amount of time. The euthanasia itself is quick. So I ask you to take the time to do it right away. As soon as you realize an animal has no chance of a meaningful recovery, make the call. You have the power to end their suffering right away. They don't have to be removed right away. The dead stock removal can happen later when it doesn't interfere with other priorities. I promise you won't be sorry if you take five minutes to do the right thing. Okay, now on to slightly happier things. So why do we even care about low stress animal handling? Well, because we have to. There are rules and regulations that we have to follow to save time and energy. Scientists are studying whether gentle handling of pigs has an effect on production. The results are promising, but there isn't a lot of hard evidence yet. One thing we know for sure 
is that pre-slaughter stress can really affect meat quality. So we really want to keep that in mind when we're shipping markets. Safety. Am I talking about pig safety or handler safety? Have you ever seen a pig panic so badly they ran right through a barrier and were running around with a gate on their head? I have. Or ran right at a human and injured them, took out their knee? Yep, I've seen that too. I'm going to share a little story from when I first started working on a farm. It was my first time working with gilts, and it was shipping day. Monday, 4.30 a.m. My boss, Barry, told me to stand at the gate with a prod and my chase board and only let the marked gilt out. The other 12 gilts had to stay in the pen. Now, if you've ever worked with gilts, you know this doesn't have a happy ending. I was clueless about sorting gilts. The Mark Gilt, of course, knew we had her in our sights. So she stayed with at least one of her pen mates at all times. Every time she got close to me, I had to stop the unmarked one. And as soon as I moved, the marked one made yet another circle of the pen. You can picture it, right? The whole time, Barry shouting instructions to me. Okay, move away from the gate, wait. Don't let that one out. Ah! We are both frustrated, and I'm ashamed to say we've both been using our prods quite a bit. Finally, Barry told me to switch places with him. I would chase the pig, and he would watch the gate. So I started pushing her forward with my prod, but at the same time, another pig approached, and Barry turned a bit. Well, my marked guilt took full advantage and ran right between his legs. Barry had short legs and watching him ride that guilt backwards with a chase board in one hand and a prod in the other is something I will never forget. In my experience, most folks who do this work long term truly do like pigs. They get a lot of joy out of their ability to move pigs quickly and efficiently. And they feel bad when things don't go as well. And maybe even more importantly, pigs that are handled well this time will be easier to handle next time. So what's your reason? Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to do some work. Don't worry, it won't be too hard. I want you to close your eyes and imagine the scariest animal possible. It might be a grizzly or a tiger or a rhino. It might be a cow. Hey, don't judge me. Now back to work. At this point, I want you to think about some times you've been trying to move pigs and it hasn't gone well. Try to come up with one extra frustrating example. Got it? Now keep that memory in mind as we continue with the presentation. You'll keep referring to it as we go on. Today we're going to practice empathy with the pigs we're moving. We're also going to learn about a method to quickly analyze and adjust our handling on the go. There's a reason I asked you to picture the scariest animal you could think of. To the pigs, we are the scary animal. We're right at the top of the predator pyramid. Even lions and tigers and grizzlies try to avoid us. So to a pig who's food for just about everybody and everything, we're terrifying. Let's use my experience with Barry as an example. I'm a grizzly on one side of the pen, blocking the ex exit, and Barry's Freddy Krueger chasing the guilt towards me with a zapper. When I look back, it's not exactly a big shock that it didn't go great. I'm embarrassed at how many years it took me to start to use better handling techniques to make things easier. All right, your turn to do some work again. 
thinking about your frustrating experience handling pigs. Where were you in relation to the pigs? Was anyone else helping you? Where were they? How many pigs were there? What could you hear? What could you feel? What could you see? Okay, hopefully everyone has had a chance to recall an especially frustrating experience handling pigs and try to put themselves back in that situation. Now, what do we do about it? Well, the first thing is to understand that you are in control. I find this decision-making process diagram very helpful. It's called the OODA loop, and it's used for all kinds of decision-making, from the military to high-stakes business decisions. It just happens to work great for animal handling, too. OODA stands for observe, orient, decide, act. What makes this system useful is being aware of the steps and also the fact that it's a loop. So you're always just one step away from starting down the road to improvement if you're struggling. The first step is to observe. Are the pigs calm or fearful? Where are other handlers situated? Are there any factors that might make movement more difficult? Then orient. Where exactly are you in relation to the pigs and how much pressure is being applied? Then take all of the factors into account and decide whether to add pressure or take it down a notch. And whatever you've decided, give it a try. The best thing about using this system for pig handling is you'll get immediate feedback and you can restart the process if needed. In business, it often takes months to know whether a decision is moving us in the right direction. Pigs are gonna let you know instantly. Let's dig a little deeper into each of these steps. When you're observing, you're looking and listening to see if the pigs are calm or fearful. A lot of us can tell just by looking at a group of animals how they're feeling towards us, but here are some useful descriptions. Calm pigs will have their head and ears low. They'll move slowly. Their focus is on where they're going, okay? Not on the handler. And they'll be pretty quiet overall. Fearful pigs will have their head and ears up. They might stop or turn around. As they get more fearful, they become more and more focused on the handler instead of where they're supposed to go. And then if we don't release some pressure, all of these things will just intensify and make things worse. All right, so we've observed the current state of our group of pigs. Now we're going to orient and figure out how much pressure we're actually applying. Here's some comparisons of increasing and decreasing pressure to help us. So that list makes it very easy to compare the two ends of the spectrum and figure out where we're at on the scale. Now that we have a good awareness about our situation, we can decide whether to add more pressure or to decrease the pressure. As soon as pigs start to show signs of fear, we want to release some pressure. Once their ears go up and their focus turns to the handler instead of where they're supposed to go, we know we've added a little too much pressure. Now I know our instinct is to make those pigs go, get the job done. It's the hardest thing in the world sometimes to take a step back and let them investigate and adjust. 
to be quiet instead of yelling louder or banging the rattle against the wall to get the most noise possible out of it. I get it, but I promise the less is more approach can work even better than the more is more approach. So now you're inside your OODA loop and you've acted to either increase or decrease pressure. The pigs will let you know right away if you made the right call and you can make adjustments from there. As you go through the job, you can reassess as many times as necessary. Okay, now I'm going to go through a few tips and tricks that I've seen used in different environments. What I'm not going to do is tell you exactly what will work in your situation. These are general things that you can try. Maybe you're already using some or most of these techniques. Every farm is different. So depending on your setup, it might be worthwhile to just pick one or two of these and see if they work for you. Here we go. I know this one's not sexy. It's one we've all heard before. But I urge you, hang those suckers everywhere. You never need a board until you really, really, really need a board. And you don't want to have to go hunting for one in the middle of a task, right? Spend those extra few minutes to set things up properly. Make sure gates are secure. Clear junk out of the alley. We all know Murphy's Law with pigs. If something can go wrong, it will go wrong. I think we've all seen something like this. Better yet, ensure flooring surfaces are as consistent as possible and that no unfamiliar objects are in the way of the pig's movement. Yikes. Now with younger pigs, we can use their bubble to our advantage. We usually want to go to the front of the pen and have them gently move around us. In general, younger pigs are a bit easier to move because of their strong herd instinct and large flight zone. It typically doesn't take much to get them going and we can move quite a few at a time. So to keep things moving smoothly, we want to make sure we have a clear alley with smooth transitions. Lighting and airflow are key. If our loadout has a fan, we really want to use it. If there are gaps in our ramp, we want to cover them. Having a few rubber mats on hand that you can place as needed can be super helpful. Air blowing up through the gaps in the loading ramp or sunlight flooding in through the side of the trailer can be a real shock to pigs and blocking it can make a really big difference when you're shipping. Now you can experiment with group sizes. Personally, I've found that optimal group sizes and the amount of pressure vary quite a bit depending on lots of factors. So it's worthwhile to use the, the OODA loop to try out different approaches and see what works best today, right? Is it minus 30? Is it plus 30? This is where you'll make your own custom adjustments to the plan. So here's an example of some pigs being shipped. Loud, continuous noise is confusing for pigs and can increase anxiety, which hinders smooth flow. In this case, these two pigs move forward away from the safety of the group. If the handler stopped making noise, they might keep moving up the ramp. Instead, the noise scares the pigs and they instinctively seek protection within the group. Notice also the excessive amount of physical pressure the handler is placing on the back pigs, which causes them to bunch, preventing them from driving the front pigs forward. So what do you think? Do you agree with the narrator? Is there way too much pressure? Things often seem much more clear in hindsight, right? Or if someone has it on camera. When we aren't actually in the situation anymore, we can see it. That's something to keep in mind. Often things will not be super clear to us while we're doing the task. We might have to take a step back to detach and see the whole situation. I'm going to share another technique with you that I just heard about. Now, full disclosure, I've never actually tried this myself, 
but I heard an animal handling expert talk about it at the Manitoba swine seminar and he swears it works. He says that loading goes even better with zero noise. I'm going to leave that with you and I'd love it if some of you give it a try and let me know how it goes. I'll share my contact information at the end of the presentation. So you can feel free to email me and cuss me out if it doesn't work. Now the techniques I've talked about so far work for animals that haven't had a lot of human contact. But what happens once they become breeding stock? I think most of us have had some experience with gilts and sows that seemed like they were just waiting for the next opportunity to make our lives difficult. As pigs get older and more familiar with being handled, their bubble gets smaller and it's less of a factor when we want to move them. So if the bubble doesn't work the same as it used to, what things should we consider? Well, mature pigs rely heavily on their senses, especially their sense of smell and hearing. Their vision doesn't really work the way ours does, so their depth perception is quite poor. That's why they often stop suddenly when there's a change in flooring or a puddle. They can't tell if it's just different flooring or if they're about to fall through it and disappear forever. How about this? How many times have you been moving sows or gilts in a breeding row and they stop to sniff every other backside in that row? Pigs have an exceptional sense of smell. This is a big part of the reason the lead pig stops when she gets to the entrance of a room or a trailer. She's checking to make sure it's safe to enter, that there are no tigers or Freddy Kruegers. When this happens, it's really important to let her sniff and take her time. If you try to pressure the lead sow by touching her, she might just turn around and try to get back with the herd. Often, you can lightly touch the second sow and she'll get the group moving again. Or this, have you ever been moving a prolapsed sow to the dead room so that you can euthanize her without taking the Hercules all the way to her farrowing crate? What do you notice? It's like she knows what's coming. 10 meters away and she just stops and will not go any further. She can smell the death in the cooler, even if it's clean. So is it worth it to save a trip with the Hercules? Well, that's not for me to tell you, but it's something for you to consider next time. When moving gilts and sows, we wanna use smaller group sizes. All the rules about setting ourselves up for success still apply. We still wanna use a chase board. We wanna clear the alleys. Make sure the gates are secured. There aren't too many things more annoying than moving a group of sows and having a gate fall over right in front of them and startling them, right? Loud noises and sudden movements will make pigs pause and search out the source. If I'm bringing a group of gilts and sows into a fairing room and the receiver is yelling, hey, five more from the other side of the room, that's not exactly going to help me. I've seen this happen over and over again in barns where the staff generally understand low stress pig handling. So what's going on? Are they trying to make things difficult? Do they just not care? I think they just haven't thought about how they are the lion. It's habit. We get so used to doing things a certain way that it takes a huge effort to push us to change the little things that we don't even notice anymore. This is where the OODA loop comes in. Because now you know about making small adjustments as you go, you can apply this technique anytime. So even though breeding age animals rely more heavily on their own senses than herd instinct, it often helps to move more experienced sows with gilts if you possibly can. The sows are more confident. 
and they can provide an added sense of security for the gilts. The gilts are doing this all for the first time, right? As long as they're moving in the correct direction, just let them. Even if they're moving very slowly. Be careful not to accidentally add pressure by following too closely or making noise. When they stop to sniff, let them. They're just making sure it's safe to proceed. And if it seems like they've been standing still for a while and won't restart, you can give a little tap to the second sow. The lead animal is already feeling a little fearful. And if you tap her, she might just turn right around. The second animal can still feel the herd around her. So she's more likely to be brave and start moving again. Now, a lot of the time when we're filling a farrowing room, things go pretty well, right up until you need her to go into a crate. How many times do you see a sour gilt walk perfectly fine, right up until she gets to the crate and then she stops dead in her tracks? So what do you do at this point? Pushing from behind usually just makes her wanna back up. It's almost like she's forgotten how to turn. All she's focused on is that gate in front of her, which looks like a solid wall from her point of view, right? So if you are going to touch her to add a bit of pressure, where is the best spot? Well, it turns out it's not where most of us think. It turns out you want to touch her shoulder on the same side as the crate. When you tap her there, she'll automatically lift her head and turn to see what's causing the touch. And this will often get her to notice the opening to the crate where she can escape the pressure. Now this next tip is something I haven't used very much but it sometimes works when nothing else does. And I've actually used this one myself recently. I was at a farm where the staff were generally very good at moving animals, but they had this one guilt that they brought into a farrowing room the day before, and she just stalled halfway to her crate. So she had been there for almost 24 hours and the supervisor asked if I could help. Now keep in mind, a few different people have tried their luck with this animal and she's defeated all of them. What do you think I tried? Yep, we put a little bit of feed in a scoop and led that guilt right to her crate. It took less than five minutes. We had two people, so one of us led with the feed and the other guided by making an alley with the sorting board. But if you're alone, it works just as well to stay back and throw a few crumbs of feed ahead to the pig. Pigs are pretty much always open to searching for feed. In nature, that's how they spend most of their time. Now, a word of caution, don't put down so much feed that she wants to stay in one spot and eat all day. Just the tiniest nibble to tempt her and switch her focus away from her fear. Now, what if none of these things work? This is the real world. We're working with live animals. I'm not so naive that I think we won't ever struggle again. So what if you're faced with pigs that just won't go? What then? I'm going to share one more embarrassing story with you. I was supposed to move a group of sows into a farrowing room one afternoon. I let out five or six and they started to go down the hallway, but about halfway there, they stopped, like really stopped. So what did I do? I yelled, I pushed, I swore, I sweated quite a lot. I'd never seen this happen before where no matter what I did, they just would not go. So of course I yelled and slapped and pushed some more. 
Well, after about 10 minutes that seemed like 10 hours, I gave up. I went to get some help. Now I had to walk all the way to the end of the row I was in and exit through the back row beside it. Well, guess what? On my way, I found the source of the problem. There had been an abortion overnight and I hadn't cleaned it up. It was right in line with where the sows were stopped. The abortion had been sitting there in plus 30 degrees for hours. Those sows could smell it and it scared them. As soon as I cleaned it up, they walked right past. So giving up actually helped me to get the job done. That was a big lesson for me. Detaching, both mentally and physically, can give you a perspective that's impossible to see while you're actively engaged with the problem. So if things just aren't progressing, you can always push the pause button. Give yourself and the animals the space and time to de-stress. If you've tried adding pressure and it hasn't had the effect you were looking for, try backing off and letting the animals reset. The truth is, yes, this is going to take time, but so does fighting them all the way. It's perfectly okay to walk away and take a break. Of course, you want to make sure the pigs are in a secure area and they can't destroy the place. Or maybe you have a coworker who's fresh and can give it a try. The bottom line is we're human. We have emotions and time pressures that affect us, even when we're doing our very best not to let them. And pigs have fears and desires that make them seem totally stubborn at times. So be patient with the pigs and be even more patient with yourself. All right, a quick summary to wrap things up. Look up and out to catch poor doers early. Do the right thing for the pig. Give the OODA loop a try. Less pressure is the right answer 90% of the time, maybe more. And detaching from the situation can be a superpower. See, I kept my word. You can send me your complaints. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mara. This was, this was a great and very, very interesting presentation. Uh, let's let's ask around if people have any questions. Does anybody have any questions? They can just unmute themselves and uh, ask a question, or if they want to type in their questions in the chat box, that can be done as well. Oh, Kevin has a question. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, that crazy guy uh, was just doing market loading last week again, doing some training, and we had no sound, no vocalization during the loading of those markets. And we did have some rattle paddle going and other things, but no vocalization at all when loading markets, and we had some good success again. So that crazy guy is still around and, and still working on it. So it is that daily process to work on for sure. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. That is awesome and good to hear from you. Awesome. Any other questions? Mara, before we let you go, like if there was one take home message. Oh, we have a question from Levi. Go ahead, Levi. Unmute yourself and ask the question, please. Have you ever tried? loading pigs without using a prod? Yes, I have definitely. I have, it's been a long time since I've loaded markets, but yet yeah, we've loaded gilts and obviously smaller pigs like nursery size pigs and weanlings, we've definitely not used a prod. 
I think the only animals I've used a prod on in quite a long time are, are called sows. So yeah, it's definitely possible to do it without a prod. It just takes a little different mindset. Mara, it's Lynn with South Cork. I'm actually wondering in your experience in barns, what has been, uh, what's the most common problem you see and what's the easiest solution? The most common problem I see is that people have a hard time putting themselves in the pig's place. And when there are other people around, it tends to magnify, right? So if you're moving a pig and there's someone else there, you don't want that pig to stop. You want them to keep going. And unfortunately, that's when we add pressure. And that's when the pig stops or backs up or turns around or does whatever, right? So the people are under pressure and then they add pressure to the pigs and it's not it's not deliberate they're not deliberately saying well i'm just going to screw up this whole movement because i just want to go no they just don't even realize what's happening so if they could just sort of you know take note of things as it's happening i think they'd be a lot further ahead Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if there aren't any, uh, I would like to thank you again, Mara, for today's today's presentation. Thank you so much. That was great information. I hope uh, folks enjoyed it. Um, before we conclude today's session, I would just like uh, to let you know that our next webinar will be on April 19th on how to save money in your hog operation with Dr. Danilo Soto with Western Ag Supply. Be sure to register.